It is Tuesday, August 9th here in Draft Shark Studios in Rochester, New York. Welcome to another installment of our Team Insider Series. I'm your host, Matt Schaff. With me, as always, is Jared Smola. And joining us today to talk Buccaneers is a man in his 10th season covering the team. He spent 19 years with the Tampa Bay Times before joining The Athletic in 2018. He is co-author of the book, Champa Bay. And you can follow him on Twitter, at Greg Allman. Greg, thanks very much for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. Hope you're doing well. Absolutely. Hope you're doing well as well. Um, Leonard Fournette has been a big story, and pun is semi-intended, to be honest. He's been a big story (laughs) since the spring. He eventually re-signed with the team. He got out of shape. He got back into shape. And now he should be the clear lead back from the start of the season. But behind him, what is the running back depth chart looking like? Do you expect Rashad White, Keyshawn Vaughn, Gio Bernard? Is one of them going to emerge ahead of the others, or are we looking at a likely committee if Fournette goes down? Yeah, you know, it's hard to know. Uh, I think the preseason will probably help shake that out. But the big thing, I mean, Rashad White is definitely the upside guy. He's the guy with probably the most to gain here in the next month. You take a guy on the second day of the draft, they like him, and they want to see more of him. I don't think it's going to take Leonard Fournette off the field too much, but I do think you'll see uh, his role expand as they get more confidence in him and as they see how well he can handle the pass protection, the blitz pickup, the other things beyond just running the ball, catching the ball, those kind of things. Do you expect White to, you know, eat into Fournette's role, you know, more than we saw over the, you know, second half of last season when Fournette was pretty much handling all the all the backfield work? I mean, a little bit. I mean, I think, I mean, they're giving Fournette seven million dollars a year, so I mean, that is is very much something they're going to use as an every down back. I do think there's a little bit of not wanting to overwork Fournette. You know, if you think about the end of last year, you know, he missed a playoff game. He missed the end of last season with hamstring issues. So I think there's an awareness of not wanting to grind him into the ground over the course of the regular season at the expense of having him, you know, when you need him in the playoffs. That makes sense. Um, Chris Godwin, how is he looking coming off the ACL? And do you expect him to play come week one? Yeah, right now, I mean, whether it's week one or not, he he made good progress. I mean, he is seven months and a week out of ACL surgery, and he's practicing. He's not going full squad. He's not going contact yet. Um, But he's with the receivers every day in conditioning, in in position drills, in everything but kind of the full squad. So I I would think they'll continue to ramp him up slowly here over the next couple weeks. We're we're still five weeks from week one right now, so I think that's very much in play for him. you know, what they've said all along is, is the smart thing and that, that they want to make sure they get him back right first. There's no sense in rushing him uh, for the first month of the season, for the first week of the season at the expense of having him later. So, you know, the depth they have at receiver now with Mike Evans, with Julio Jones, with Russell Gage, um, there's less of a need to have everybody there in week one. Their, their first month is a really daunting month. Um, they're at the Cowboys at the Saints, they have the Packers and the Chiefs as their first four opponents. So it's definitely the kind of opponents you'd want to have everybody you can against, but but I don't think they'll rush things. So you mentioned that depth behind, you know, I think Chris Godwin and Mike Evans, the, the top two guys here when they're healthy. Um, you know, who do you expect to be this team's third receiver, Russell Gage or Julio Jones, as far as you know, snaps go, as far as targets go? How do you how do you think those two guys are gonna, you know, work in this offense? Yeah, th- there's probably different answers to that. Um, I mean, they give Russell Gage three years and thirty million. So I think I think the there's definitely a plan for him long before Julio got here. So I think in terms of productivity, total targets, snaps, catches, even yards, I would give the edge to Russell Gage. Um, if Julio is healthy, and that's a major if for anybody that's, that's seen him in the last two years, um, there's definitely the potential for him to do more in terms of touchdowns. If anything, you know, if you think about Julio in his career, um, he hasn't been a touchdown guy. He's been a volume yards and catches guy. Um, without being necessary, I mean, I think he has 60 touchdowns. You know, he has fewer touchdowns than, you know, most people with his level of yards and catches have. So I think that can kind of be almost the opposite here in Tampa. I think they can use Julio more on third down on the red zone um, in your key high leverage situations where having three elite receivers on the field can really benefit you. Um, I, I don't know if he'll have the same volume he's had, but I think he'll be someone they count on in those, those high leverage situations. Then how about the tight end room? How do you see that shaking up between Cameron Bray, Kyle Rudolph, their rookie, Kate Otten? And then is there, you know, what are the odds you'd put on a Rob Gronkowski return at some point this season? Um, It's silly to, to rule anything out because he's already unretired once and Brady's unretired once. I, I tend to think right now that he's done. Um, if they had something compelling or someone got hurt or there was a sudden need to really ramp things up, 
you know, for another playoff push. Um, I can see him trying to make that call, but I don't think Gronkowski is is planning to come back right now as things stand. Uh, in terms of how the tight ends shake out, Kyle Rudolph, you know, very much has the ability to be a great blocker, to be a good pass catcher. I, I think he's probably the guy that plays the most snaps of those three. Um, Cam Braid has always been a red zone specialist, a guy that, that Brady connects well, especially in, in scoring situations. So, I mean, Cam Braid could wind up with the most touchdowns of the three. Um, K. Dotton is a wild card. I mean, he, he's looked really good in training camp. He had three touchdowns in 11 on 11 Sunday, you know, in a single practice, you know, probably needs to get a little stronger, a little bigger, hasn't played much. He had an ankle injury where, you know, he went from November until last week without practicing at all. So I, I think he's a guy who could be a much bigger factor later in the year and maybe not as much early in the year. I think they'll probably lean on their bets early. Um, but no, all three, I mean, this feels like because you have Evans, Godwin, Jones, and Gage, this feels like a team that'll have probably more three receiver sets as a base than the double tight end look they liked more last year. So I'm not saying they're going to forget about their tight ends, but I don't think it'll be as prominent as it was last year uh, with Gronk leading the way. Have you seen much four wide receiver stuff from the offense where they're you know, trying to get all four of those guys on the field together? Not too much. They almost always have, I mean, what they'll do, um, they're almost always have a back in the backfield. They like to flare the back out of the backfield and, and, and put them out as a receiver. So you'll have, what is essentially a four receiver set with just, you know, Fournette yeah. in the slot or Gio Bernard or now Rashad White out there like a receiver. Um, and that's probably more likely. Um, I think they definitely like to have a little bit of a run pass feel where they're not too predictable. And, and four receiver, they've got some really good blocking receivers. Don't get me wrong, but that, that takes away some of your uh, versatility in the offense. Are we seeing Rashad White do more of that than Gio Bernard and Keyshawn Vaughn so far? Or are they working in just as much? Um, Keyshawn Vaughn is not much of a pass catcher, so I wouldn't think of him in that role. Gio's caught a ton of passes in his career. Mm -hmm. um, I think Rashad White would be very well suited for that. I mean, that's kind of a let's get the basic stuff figured out. Let's get make sure he knows all the basic stuff he needs to do before they get too involved with those kind of things. But as the year went on, I can see them doing that more with White for sure. On the defensive side, the depth chart is a lot more straightforward in Tampa than it is for many other teams around the league. So that's nice for us fantasy players. I'm sure it's nice for the Bucks too, as they <laughs> right. sort things out. At safety, though, is Logan Ryan locked into a starting role next to Antoine Winfield? No, I wouldn't say that. Um, it's probably, there's kind of three safeties that are, are going to rotate in. Winfield probably won't come off the field at all. Uh, they have a guy named Mike Edwards that was a part-time player the last three years he was in a contract year they've used a bunch of different looks they, they have a nickel with three safeties they like a lot when they go to safety it's probably more likely to be Winfield and Ryan um so no I, I would think you know between those two they have Keanu Neal who will also factor in things at some point uh I wouldn't say it's as straightforward as Ryan playing every down or being a starting safety but I mean Ryan can play nickel too so I, I Ryan will be very involved he's probably the most experienced DB they have. They have a lot of 24, 25 year olds. So his experience will pop out for sure. But I don't know that it's as, as ironclad as, as he's a starting safety. Okay. That'll be interesting to watch through the preseason. Yeah. And then from here, it looked like Devin white had a disappointing season last year. Is that how he and, or the team viewed it? I do think so. Um, it didn't have nearly the splash plays and the impact plays, the picks and the forced fumbles and recoveries that he had in that Super Bowl season or even his rookie year. Um, so wherein he made the Pro Bowl, wherein he was getting top 100 accolades, I didn't think he had nearly as good a year this past year. And I think he'll probably tell you the same. Some of that, um, you know, Levante David wasn't himself, was hurt, you know, was dealing with injuries, was sidelined at times. I think having them both together and healthy um, can really lift this defense. You know, I think some of the, Injuries they dealt with in the secondary made them less likely to uh, get exotic looks up front to blitz their inside linebackers and do some of the creative things they did really well two years ago. I think because they had so much of a, a rotating cast of backups filling in at corner that they didn't want to uh, overload those guys with too much. And I think it took away some of their creativity defensively at the expense of, of big plays for, for guys like Devin White. Mm hmm. It sounds like um, Shaq Barrett and Joe Tryon Shoyenka are looking good so far. You think that helps Devin White's pass rushing this year? Yeah, I do. I mean, you know, last year they, they had an injured Jason Pierre-Paul out there a lot mm -hmm. um, and, and didn't get the production they like to have. You know, Joe Tryon Shoyenka 
probably played a decent amount as a rookie, but was also bouncing around. He was, they dropped him as a linebacker. They used him as a nickel inside rusher. And I think now with Logan Hall and Akeem Hicks on the defensive line, they don't need to do that as much. He can kind of just be a, a pass rusher, a, mm-hmm. a, a sack artist, a guy that, that really can focus more on that. And if he does that, I mean, he's in line for a really good year. I mean, Shaq Barrett's probably the, the odds on guy to lead this team in sacks, but, but Joe would be right there as the next guy you'd think of. I mean, he'll, he'll get, a strong amount of snaps. Their only other defensive end or their outside linebacker say they really use is Anthony Nelson, who played well off the bench last year. So they'll be counting on him. I mean, they're counting on him to to kind of step into what JPP was as a really consistent every down type uh, force on the defensive line or, or on the edge at least. Mm-hmm. And that duo Barrett and JTS are a key reason you're going to find the Bucks at the top of the team defense rankings on DraftSharks.com. Well, his book. Champa Bay is on sale in various places. You can find his Bucks content on The Athletic, which is a resource that is absolutely worth the subscription, especially this time of year for us football folks. You can follow him on Twitter, at Greg Allman. Greg, thanks very much for taking the time, joining us, and lending your insight today. Hey, thank you guys for having me. Y'all have a good day. Thanks again. You too. You can find every episode of the Team Insider series as well as our divisional preview series and every other pod episode on DraftSharks.com, on YouTube, on Apple, Spotify, wherever else you like to get your podcasts. We are 12 deep now with Team Insiders. Plenty more to come. For our guest, Greg Allman, for Jared Smola, and the rest of the DraftSharks crew, I'm Matt Schaaf saying thanks so much for swimming with us.